Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Wildlife Inspired. I'm your host, Scott Keys, and today's gonna be a fantastic show. I've been looking forward to this for a couple months. Uh, My guest today is Lisa Langell, and we're gonna talk about photography as art, specifically wildlife photography as art. So if you've ever taken a picture and, and looked at the back of your phone and thought, man, how do I get this thing on my phone onto these walls or maybe somebody else's walls? This is gonna be the show for you. took this I just wanted the head the eye the bill to be all sharp and then the rest just to like melt away the thing I have to say with ducks is it's hard to get creative with ducks or waterfowl in general all right now before I bring Lisa onto the show I just I have a couple of housekeeping things I wanted to talk about and I, I do want to say thank you right off the bat. So uh, thanks for all your support on the YouTube channel. I have a couple new things coming up that I wanted to talk about. And I also want to just say thank you to all my Patreon supporters. Uh, I see them every show in the chat window, and I just get really, really excited. So if you're interested in that, I have some links down in the description of this video, and you can find out a little bit more about what that is. It's a subscription-based service, but I just do a lot of extra videos, a lot more behind the scenes, very informal stuff. Um, as long as some editing uh, tips over there. In conjunction with that, I'm also launching a a membership in this YouTube channel because a lot of people had some anxiety about going over to another platform and they already belong to YouTube and had subscriptions here. So that's brand new. So check that out. I'll be downloading the videos. I had somebody already sign up today. So that was great. I haven't downloaded many videos yet, but I have about 30 or 40 to upload over the next couple of weeks. So that'll be coming as well. So without any further ado, that's my plugs for myself. The rest of the show is dedicated to Lisa Langell. How are you doing, Lisa? I am doing great. And I'm seeing so many hellos and and how are you out here? I love seeing all the chat room and, and welcome everybody. I'm glad to be here today. And I appreciate you, Scott, for bringing me in. All right. So before we get into your your kind of theme tonight about art and, and uh, photography as it relates to wildlife, little bit about your background. Now, I've, I've found out a little bit about you, and I just want to let people know how I discovered you. So uh, you gave a presentation, which I know you do several over the course of the year, kind of a web-based um, presentation, and I was really drawn in. It was, I have the, I don't have the attention span to listen to somebody for two hours. You got me almost all two hours, Lisa. It was really, really good. And I had this concept about art. And I'm going to do, uh, just so everybody knows, I'm going to do a couple more follow-ups to this. We're not going to talk today so much about like DPI and PPI and what paper to use and, you know, how to get images to the printer. That's really not the focus. The focus is a little bit more uh, big picture, artistic, and actually how to sell a little bit as well. And this concept I had in my head, I was like, I got to find the right guest. And I saw you on this thing and I'm like, she's the one. I got to get her. And fortunately, you didn't say no. So thank you so much for coming on today. You are welcome. I appreciate it so much. You're so kind. And this is going to be fun. I already know it. (laughs) Yeah. So you're based out of Arizona. Yes. And you've been doing this for how long? I've been a photographer since I've been eight years old, obviously not professionally back then, but uh, since I was eight, I've had a camera in my hands and that's about the same time that I started bird watching with my great aunt Jo and uh, she taught me how. And then by the time I was 13, I got uh, my Canon A1 film camera, uh, you know, 35 millimeter. And then I, you know, was yearbook photographer, took a class in college in the dark room, and the rest has been mostly self-taught, and it, it's been a passion of mine ever since, but I didn't turn it into a business until 2010, and then it grew so much by 2015, I was doing it full-time. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and just pull up, here we go. So I've got your website, and I'm going to just kind of have a, a, some conversation here with you, but I am going to kind of scroll through so people will get a sense of this. Now, before the show, you actually mentioned to me that this website is short lived, right? It is. Yeah. yeah. You will it'll be sunsetting very soon. I have a whole new design happening and a lot more focused around the art side of my photography. I think there's a whole show by the way around websites cuz it people go crazy with this. It's almost this um you get into this pattern. It's like, I've done this for a year. Now I do this. Now I do this. And about two years into photography, it's like, everybody's like, I got to build a website. So they go out and they get a website 
and then they realize how difficult it is to manage and they don't sell any prints off of it. And so I got to find that that person <laughs> to come on the show as well <laughs> to talk about how yeah. to design a website to sell. Look for that in the future. Um, yeah. But scrolling through here, you don't just do wildlife. So you, there's some other stuff kind of mixed in here as well. Indeed. Yes. Yeah, I, I love wildlife. It's what I started with, and it always is going to be my passion. Uh, but I, you know, I do a variety of things from environmental portraiture to pets to, uh, you know, macro and things like that. Predominantly outdoors things. Um, even most of my portrait work is done outdoors and, you know, both with natural light and you know, studio type setups, like my Magic of Cowboys workshop in Arizona is one where we, I love it because we take photographers who hate portraiture, right? We're nature photographers. We don't want to be behind the camera photographing other people. And we go and we make it super fun. And there's some reasons why it hasn't been fun for people in the past and we just break through that uh but yes all kinds of things in there uh, abstracts are one of my favorite things as well yeah and I'm, I'm in your um your gallery now with the the some of the cowboys here i will tell you my, one of my favorite images on this um home page i'll pull it up now i think you can you could see it with me this one's really really good love this and and I have to say, these are participant images from my cowboy workshop. Ooh. I asked their permission and we they share them with me because I end up sharing those with the cowboys and all the people that support us at the ranch that we go to. So you're not, that one's mine, but you're seeing in addition to that, I mean, this is what people are capturing and it's, it's amazing to see what they can do. And I'm proud to share that. So this is a collaborative exercise in, within that portfolio. And I do want to just point out, you, you mentioned, you know, workshops and stuff. I'll put uh, all of Lisa's contact information in here, but you will see on her website, um, not only print sales, but a lot of workshops. And you've got some workshops coming up recently, because I saw it in the chat window. You've got hummingbirds coming up. What else is on your on your near term next couple months? Yeah, so three back-to-back -back hummingbird workshops. I, I see some comments about that in the chat window. Um, it is a lot of fun. Uh, and then I have, I'm going to be in Alaska from May 25th to June 30th to run four uh, Magic of Alaska workshops where we do, oh my gosh, that tour is so diverse. We do everything. <laughs> we do bears, we do boats, we do, you know, the sea flying. We, we get about 70 to 90 species of birds and mammals. And I know there's a couple of people who have been on that tour in the room, like Sarah, and um, that is just so much fun. So I'll be doing that. And then I get back from that. And I had a couple of events that I was supposed to do. Um, NECCC had their 75th anniversary conference, the New England Camera Club Council. That unfortunately has been canceled um, until next year year but so I have my jo July a little bit back to myself and then um, and then it kicks in again before long I've got um, the cowboy workshop magic of cowboys in October and I didn't put a ton of stuff on the calendar this year not sure where COVID was going to be right. but next year you'll see another full slate of things um, oh I all right have, I'm, by I'm the gonna, way, oh, um, in ahead. 2022 I've got oh yeah go ahead sorry go ahead. there sorry, was a Scott, little delay ahead. so I jumped in go ahead don't finish up oh I was just going to say I've got a hummingbird workshop in Ecuador and then Galapagos as well in 2022. So it's going to be a fun year. Yeah. Fun, you know, from this point forward for a year. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and share your screen, Lisa. So if you're if you're prepared to share. All right. And anything yeah. that you have pulled Tell me up. No. What you would like to see. Well, what okay. I'm what I wanted to talk about a little bit, and I'll keep mine up for now. Uh, we'll get to, to that okay. screen share in a second, but I'm going to keep my screen here. Um, I, I had this idea, though, that when when you look at things, whether or not you saw it the same way I do. So do you when you see images, even your own images, do you put them into these buckets? So, for example, sometimes I see an image and I say, that's a story. That's a that's a documentation. And I see another image and it's kind of like, oh, that, that'd be a good calendar. Or I could see that in Birds and Blooms magazine. Uh, not a sponsor, yeah. by the way. I, I just gave them a plug, I guess. But if you don't know what Birds and Blooms is by now, it's probably um, something you don't really follow that much. But th then every now and then I see images and I say, that's art. Do you do the same sort of yeah. thing? I do. I, I really do. And I try to shoot for those different buckets, if you will. You know, there's the classic nature photography photography, what I call calendar and magazine style photography. And then there's things, you know, I've photographed 
you know, uh, in Yellowstone, a coyote running right out in front of a car. And that's kind of journalistic, you know, might need that for something at one point in time. Coyote was fine, by the way. Um, you know, I, I capture things that I think would make really good art. And in fact, um, I, I just want to say this contests are awesome. And, you know, I encourage people to do them because of the fact you can learn a lot from them. But there's a very specific genre of photography and type of image that I think works well for competition. And there's a whole bunch of them that don't, but it doesn't mean that they're less than. They're different categories with different qualities that don't necessarily meet what are related to images that are perfect and suitable for calendars and magazines. That's a very specific bucket, but there's a whole lot of other photography out there that's wonderful for a whole lot of different purposes beyond that. So I kind of think in those buckets, the art bucket, the, uh, you know, the ethereal bucket, you know, just some of the things that I gravitate to, but they're not always what everybody would gravitate to, but isn't that art? Yeah. And one of the things that I think is interesting is, I, sometimes I, I don't want to say argue with people, but I have this, somebody might say something, well, it's, it's not sharp enough or it's not, you know, you missed. And I look at it and I'm like, yeah, for me, I don't like, I don't care so much about it being technically perfect all the time. Now for a contest, and I think it's a, a really valid point here. A lot of contests will look at a photo and sometimes just technically kick it out. Something's not mm -hmm. technically perfect. I had a, a gentleman uh, that judges contests look at a photo of mine and say, I would have liked it except uh, you cropped like, I don't know, maybe like cropped a, a feather off or that should have been in the frame or something like that. And I thought, oh, like that, like that's what you, that's what you don't like about this. I said, the colors are amazing. <laughs> like, look at these colors. And it, yeah. it really was a different mindset between somebody who is um, hung up on technical parts and and sometimes those technical shooters really do themselves a disservice when it comes to trying to print art because yeah. when it's printed on a wall all that really matters is pretty yeah so true it kind of reminds me you know i used to love to watch figure skating when i grew up i even took some figure skating classes and it reminds me of those contests you know where the the judging or the olympics where they have the technical merit and the artistic merit and you know so i think of photography somehow like that like there's a good balance between the two. I mean, you got to have some technical adequacy, yes. but you need a whole lot of artistic merit if it's going to go into that art bucket anyway. Yeah. yeah. And I've seen a lot of photos that are incredibly technically done beautifully, but they don't evoke anything. You know, it, it's action, beautiful color, you know, stop the action or whatever you're doing, but it still doesn't make you feel something. And art to me should communicate a story, make you think something, make you feel something, even if it's bad or wrong, it should evoke a feeling. And uh, to me, if it's not, it's just a documentation shot. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead. Um, I don't know if you've got your screen share. I'm going to give it a shot. You may see a big blue, yeah, I can do that. You may see yeah, a big blue Skype window for just a second. And Lisa, you can just pull up. I wanted to give you control here so that um, we're okay. not bouncing back and forth. Pull up any image you want, anything you want to talk about. I can bounce back to my screen as well. So, you know, we can kind of uh, ping pong the, the Skype window over here. Okay. And hopefully we'll get it to pull. There we go. All right. It's coming up. Yeah. All right. And um, I, I do want <laughs> right. to. So I, I'll just. Go ahead. Go ahead. Was there a moment no, no, for you? Ahead. Was there a moment for you when something clicked with with um, art? So, in other words, I assume at some point you were trying to sell prints, like a lot of wildlife photographers think, right? I got a lot of likes on Facebook. Everybody's going to come yeah. running to buy my artwork now, and they set up that website, and all of a sudden it's just crickets, and nobody wants these prints. <laughs> and did you have those moments where you were concerned about? being able to actually make a living with this? You know, Scott, the whole business started that way. You know, I, I laugh at my mistakes, but the whole business, you know, back in 2010, when I first started it, you know, everyone was saying to me, oh, your pictures are so pretty and they're beautiful. And, you know, you should shoot at Nat Geo and, you know, you should sell your work and all of those kind of comments that I've now seen a lot of other people get those same kinds of comments. And it doesn't mean, you know, it, it, doesn't mean they're not good photographers it's just what I realized is friends and family are supportive uh, most of the time <laughs> and you know and a lot of people like the work 
But so I was like, okay, I should start a business. And what I did not realize is that those people have zero knowledge of this industry. So it would be like telling, you know, your friend, Sam, you make the best hamburgers. You should open up a hamburger franchise. And just because they make great hamburgers means they know know potentially nothing about the business and so it you know it was the same thing you know you go and you hang your shingle and you put your website images out there and you wait and you're going to wait forever um there, there was so much more to it but yeah that's how I got started and honestly I'm really glad I did but it was very different from my initial interpretation of how the business ran and even though I did some research apparently wasn't enough so yeah I've had to make a lot of pivots over the years and just out of curiosity, you you worked full time before this, though, and you you left a full time job to do this as your career. I did. I uh, worked as a psychologist. I worked with kids with disabilities initially in schools, and that was in about two thousand to two thousand five. And then I was doing a lot of cutting edge research at the time with uh, the way kids learn and and prevention of learning disabilities and some really quick assessments that actually had high validity and reliability. And long story short, we were able to identify kids a lot earlier in the at-risk process. And I got really involved in those circles and I ended up consulting all over the world in in doing that, primarily in Canada, but also in New Zealand, Mexico, and Guam. And um, it was a really amazing journey and, you know, got pretty known in those circles for that type of work. And uh, but in 2015, uh, my photography business, I mean, I was literally taking vacation time to run workshops in Alaska. And so and that business just kept growing and at, there was a point where I just I needed to cut bait on something because I couldn't do it all. And um, I decided I'd done psychology for 20 years and I was really ready for a new challenge. And so I just plunged in head first from part time to full time photo- uh, photography. It was not easy. I got to tell you, it was certainly not easy. There were days where it was literally, do I have two dollars to put gas in my car? I'm not sure. Let me scrape up some change. No lie. But um, I can say I did it all. Uh, without going into debt. And um, I, it's been wonderfully successful for me, but it's been a huge continual learning curve. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I've talked to a couple photographers who have made that switch. I'll reference um, Jamie Heimbuck, who I think the world oh, of, yeah. she's a conservation photographer and just, yeah. I really, really just adore her. She um, told a very similar story, you know, just how, how difficult it is. And let me ask you an honest question without workshops, could you yeah. could you support yourself full time selling prints alone? Um, I, that'd be an interesting question. The market is changing quite a bit, and I'm also pushing myself more. I would say not to the level that I'm comfortable with yet, but I also am transitioning, and this year has been a transition year for me on so many levels that I'm hoping that that could be. I can, hopefully I could sustain on that, but I, here's the thing, Scott, is, and I think COVID has taught all of this uh, pretty well to us, is that putting all your eggs in one basket is not a good idea. And luckily, I've never done that. I've always had, you know, workshops, the art, uh, some, you know, um, remote and distance learning kinds of things with the webinars well before COVID. Uh, and so I haven't put all my eggs in one basket, but it's a really good lesson not to in the future. So I hope to continue to broaden what I do or to and um, but that's really where a lot of my emphasis now. I, I'll keep my current workshops as they are, but I don't plan on doing a lot of new ones in different places. Mm-hmm. I want to keep a good balance between travel and home and art and, and bringing people to Phoenix too. Or, you know, I live in Stockdale, but same difference uh, in, in things here around the art side in the future. So a few goals. Yeah, and the reason I ask that is I just have this incredible curiosity about, I, I mean, I see and talk to a lot of people who just, find it incredibly difficult to sell prints even and and yeah. and I think part of the thing I'm I'm interested in is is it your experience that selling prints is more about your ability to market and understand the audience and not necessarily being the greatest photographer in the world so in other words is it possible a 10 out of 10 photographer could make way less money than a 6 out of 10 photographer yeah, I think it's a really good question. Um, I'll say this one thing first is that 
whatever you subsidize, you tend to get more of. And that's not my quote. I think that was Al Gore's quote from a long time ago, but I've always loved it. So whatever you focus on and you work at, you tend to get more success at. So for me, you know, when it was workshops, you know, you do them well and you become more successful there. And now it's the art. And that's really where I have been transitioning to. And this has been within the past three or four years primarily. But I, I think in in any business, whether or not it's photography, basket weaving, whatever, in any business, in my experience, you have to be a really strong, in this case, photographer and a hell of a business person. Mm -hmm. You really have to know your business and continually push yourself. I mean, you'll never work harder than you do when you're working for yourself. And I worked really hard at my psychology business, but you just really end up working hard. I mean, this past week alone, I've probably worked 14 to 16 hours a day. And I'm not saying that'll always be the case, but I'm trying to prepare for when, you know, the travel starts and the workshop starts and getting a lot of other things underway. It's just always that way. But um, going back to your question of, do you need to be you know, a very excellent photographer? Yeah, that definitely helps. But you really need to be a good business person. You have to be a good people person. And I don't mean the fake kind. I mean, genuinely, like truly caring about people. And, you know, you got to have your boundaries because there'll be people that'll just take and take. But you really, I think, thoughtful and considerate and respectful and honest and dependable and, you know, someone that people want to be around, you know, go to some workshop with a curmudgeon. You know, I've heard of it. I've seen it done. But, you know, that's not at all my style. So I think those things all come together to make a successful business. Um, it isn't just product. It's everything around the yeah. product. Yeah. And I, I think there's such a, a point to that. Do you notice when you're. Um, and you've done galleries, right? So you've set up mm -hmm. some galleries. Do you notice when you're present in the gallery that it's much easier to sell those pieces? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the gallery owners, you know, the more that you can be there, the better, because you're the best representation for your work. People come and when they understand the stories behind the image, and yeah, they can read a placard on the wall, but when they hear you tell the stories and you get to and have a relationship with them, people want to take that piece home because it's a remembrance of that experience. It's you going home with them a little bit more so than just the print alone. It's that story. They can retell that story to their viewers in their home. Um, you know, I have a, a gentleman that uh, this wasn't part of a gallery, but a gentleman that just bought about five or six thousand dollars worth of work from me. And he bought a big first batch and then he bought another batch of work. And, you know, he he was like, send me your business card, send me this and that. I want to put them in my room. He has a, um, different walls dedicated to his very favorite artists and he just yeah. built a new home. And so, you know, we talked about each image. We consulted on each one about what size and what style and what unique things we could do with it. I mean, they were definitely, they were pictures I had taken in the past, but they were definitely customized. And that was such a fun experience. I got to know him. He gets to know me and, you know, what a great story for him to be able to tell. And he's got this whole little booklet that he put together of his favorite artists. And, you know, this is just, it's a collaborative integrated thing. I mean, yes, people can go buy an eight by 10 and hang it on their wall and, you know, without a story, but when you're buying bigger pieces, you want to have that relationship yeah. and, and I want to have that relationship. Yeah. I think there's so, and, and it's true of so many businesses, you, at the end of the day, most of what you're buying is a person. You know, you're supporting a, yeah. a person. I, I've got, you know, 13 pizza shops between here and work that I could stop at. You know, all the pizza is about the same. I, yeah. I like one a yeah. little bit better than the rest. So that's, he gets my business every once a week, one pizza a week, you know, he gets my business. Oh. I'm buying, I'm buying <laughs> that guy because I just like the guy behind the counter sometimes. So, yeah. And I think that's true of restaurants. It's true. And it's certainly yeah. true of artists because there is at times a very intimate connection between art and people. Yes. There really is. I mean, it, how can you not, you know, I mean, artist, art is something from a person. I mean, granted, somebody made the stuff in Target and Walmart and, you know, wherever you get kind of commodity pictures for the wall, somebody made that too. But, you know, there's no story behind that. There's no uniqueness behind that. There's no limited nature behind that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a different genre, but, um, 
uh, the people part of it is is so much. I mean, can you talk about that picture you put on the wall from you know the big box store? Not much you can say about it, but if you had a picture that had a story, I mean, I'm sure you have your own, you know, people listening, you have your own pictures on the wall. Mm -hmm. You have a story behind that. You know, I saw that egret here and it did that, or we went on this trip to Antarctica and this was the, what the penguin did or whatever. It's, it's the stories around the picture that make people more and more engaged. Yeah. Now, one of the things that when you set up one of your galleries, I remember you telling a story about this and, and you said you got a lot of good response from it but you didn't get any sales from it. And, and then you approached it a little bit differently. So tell, tell that story real quick. Yeah. Yeah, my first actually three or four gallery showings, um, you know, they were experiments. Um, I didn't know it, <laughs> but, but they were experiments. But anyhow, you know, I would put these beautiful pieces out, some of my most popular and, you know, well-recognized images, stuff that had won awards or have been published in calendar. Uh, and I would print all of it. And it, as you know, it costs a lot to print these things into, you know, larger formats and, you know, the canvas or metal or whatever you're going to display them on. And people would ooh and ah, and they kept coming in. I mean, quite literally, there was a little crowd going on. Um, and and people would love to see it. And what did you shoot it with? And, you know, how did you get these shots? And where were you? They want the story. Well, it does, <laughs> I have to say, the story helps, but the image has to be the right image. And I didn't realize this because people would look and ooh and ah, and then they would walk away. And I was like, oh, you know, am I not a good salesperson? Am I not, you know, is it not the right picture? Do they not like it? I'm thinking, how much better do I have to be? You know, I mean, I know it's not in neat Nat Geo, but it'd been in some national magazines, won a few awards and, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. I couldn't figure out what it was. And, and then it, hit me like a ton of bricks one day and I had done this gallery here a year prior and it's an invited gallery a juried gallery and uh they allow you to exhibit for 30 days and so I I submitted and, and got the got the gig um to you know like the year prior and I exhibited all my Arizona wildlife stuff you know because it was in Arizona and that's it's another little lesson is people tend to buy the things that are local for the most part. I mean, yeah, you'll occasionally get the person that would buy, for example, a, a penguin because they too went to Antarctica, but for the most part, local sells. So I was selling local wildlife and, uh, you know, people came in droves and they never bought. I think I sold five pieces the whole month at most. And, um, it just wasn't anything very successful. And I was like, well, that's a lot of money for nothing. And keep in mind, when you do a gallery, you do a split. And, you know, some of those splits are, are you know, standard. And a lot of them can be 60-40, uh, 50-50. Uh, you know, so you have a lot of giveaway before you get your part of the pie. And so they invited me to come back the next year and I really thought about it and I, I get why they wanted me to come back. You know, people came, <laughs> you know, it was like a lot of people there, but I didn't sell very much. And I was like, we didn't do very well last year. I was kind of surprised. And, um, and I said, okay, but I'm going to completely do it different this time. And in this case, I didn't even have art to sell. I had no physical thing to show them or, or even, in a picture of it, I did a Photoshop mock-up of a concept that was kind of like maybe what I thought I could come up with. I mean, it was so like, here's first draft, you know, and I said, this is what I'm thinking. I said, but I don't want to do any more photographs. I said, I want to do something. And I kind of described what it was. And I'll show you a couple examples of that here on my screen yep. um, as I go through this. Interesting how this completely changed. Let me see here if I can um, pull up some of these. They're in here. Um, hey, here's a couple. So these are some of the pieces. And uh, there's, I'll leave the sandhill cranes up for a minute. This is a very simple one. I'll pull up some more complicated ones in a minute. Uh, but these types of pieces. So I did all local Arizona wildlife. I built my own backdrops with reclaimed wood. The mounts were all done. These are uh, 300 GSM warm tone cotton rag paper, and then a piece of mulberry paper behind it, which has plant material embedded in it. And it's a handmade paper. And I deckled the edge of that. Deckled means tear. And then I have it in, nestled in two-way glass frames and then mounted to these backdrops. 
And I did a lot of different ones. This one is actually in my living room right now. I kept this for myself. This is a five and a half foot long piece of uh, saguaro, you know, the tall saguaro cactus with the arms, a uh, five and a half foot long piece of that. It's as tall as I am. And then the uh, ba wooden backdrops with the uh, red tail hawks, which um, I love John James Audubon work. And I wanted to do kind of this vintage style wildlife for all of these pieces. And uh, let's see here. I think I have some more that I can show you. Um, let me see where they are. Here's a couple more here. So there's another one. And I did not just wildlife, but some landscapes as well. And I did a ton of them. I think I came in with 40 some pieces of large pieces. And then I had a bunch of small things, you know, for people that come there on vacation, they can only fit so much in their um, luggage. And, you know, you do some things that are not as breakable. And, you know, so I had a variety of things and I sold the heck out of it. It was a month long gallery and I gave them back stock. And I was gone to a workshop and I came back and they said, Lisa, we're, we're almost sold out. Um, they we're asking people to come back and get their pieces. They had put sold signs on them. They're like, we don't have anything on the walls. So I quick scrambled and worked like a crazy person. Uh, my dad and I did actually together so we could get this all done. And, um, and we made a whole bunch more pieces and then those sold too. And I was, it was extremely successful. I honestly was shocked at how much sold and they were pieces, you know, just to give you an idea of the price range. I didn't have a lot of uh, materials that I had to spend a lot on. So I could charge less, but I would say like a piece like this, if I go uh, scratch my brain, I think this was around $600. Um, you know, there were some that were up to $800 and that was, that was ballpark the price range for these larger pieces and they sold like crazy. And then I had orders afterwards for pieces. So I had to make pieces afterwards and um, I can't wait until kind of COVID is done so I can get back and doing some of these galleries again. I haven't done it now because nobody's shopping and nobody's going into retail spaces, but um, once this is over, <laughs> I'll, I'll go back out there and do some more. And have you done the, the type of thing where you would go to like, I'll say the word fair, but where you set up like the tent and, have you tried that as well? And is that a different type of experience than than a, a more formal gallery? Yeah, well, the the whole thing is so different. You have, and I've done a, a very limited amount of that. I don't think that I would enjoy on a regular basis. Um, it's so much work to set up for a weekend and you just have a lot of uh, kind of what I call pain in the anatomy stuff <laughs> that you have to do for that. I mean, it's all hard, right? I mean, even this gallery, you know, you still got to go in, it, it, you know, haul all the pieces in. I had to get a U-Haul to haul everything in and out. And, you know, it's just a lot. But um, I have done that and I know people are very successful doing that. So I'm not going to, you know, say anything negative other than it's, it's a lot of work and you lose every weekend and you're constantly on the road driving around. So if you like that, um, awesome. But you can have a wildly successful weekend and then the next one is rain and crap and, you know, you, you lose every bit of profit that you might have gained. So I, for me personally, I prefer a little more steady uh, process. And so you'll see some of those things coming on my website. It's going to be pretty fun when you see it. So yeah, and it, it's, it's going to be it's, a different, yeah. It's tough to make a living when you can't charge a premium for the piece. So you know, yeah. if your materials, let's say, and I, I'm just going to make up a figure, let's say the materials for a print, uh, like the ones you were doing with reclaimed wood and stuff, let's say you could get that for $50 and you could sell it for 500 or 600, yeah. you can make money. But when you're trying to, and I don't want to use the term like nickel and dime, but if you're trying to make money selling $50 prints, you know, it's tough. Like it, you, you really have to sell volumes. And then where are you going to sell 100 or 300 or 500 prints a year? To, yeah. to make, even if it's just a side income, like, are you really yeah. going to be able to do that with, with maybe just an online presence thinking my stuff is good enough. Again, my stuff is good enough that people will just come get it. And I, I think one, one of the things I'm hearing is presence matters, personality matters, the artist, like that's what ultimately sometimes will sell. And then you yeah. figure out where that, that niche is. So maybe it's yeah. a piece of personality. Maybe it's a piece of the, um, in your case, a piece of Arizona. In my case, it might be a piece of Pennsylvania um, or, mm -hmm. or just finding that little groove that people can relate to. And, and somebody could say, that's it. Like now I found somebody. And yeah. it is surprising sometimes 
I bet you when you first that when the first person walked up and said, "Yeah, I'd like to buy that," and wrote out like a five or seven hundred dollar check, you're like, "Whoa, that's yeah, that's that's like a lot of money." Thanks. <laughs> like you, that yeah. first those first couple pieces probably felt like really good, and then you realize I got to do that. Like that's how if I'm going to make a living at this, I've got to make my worth my work worth that to sustain. Yes, yes, you do, and it has to be consistent, and it has to. I mean, there's. You know, everybody can do something once, but, you know, can you replicate it? Can you consistently do it? And can you do it in a way that is easily replicatable? And, you know, and that's some of the things that, you know, I sometimes find challenging because supplies come and go, you know, things that you like are no longer available or, you know, or the resources aren't there. And, you know, and can you do it? And even things like shipping, you have to think about the box that it's going to go in and making your piece so it'll fit in a standard size shipping box so that by the time it gets all the packing in it and all this and that, it's 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 really good to go. And then having a professional packer ship it for you. You know, I shipped something. I was doing a um, uh, an interior designer I was working with in Oklahoma uh, wanted these pieces that had a Native American flair to them. And so I built these three custom pieces. I say built because it was photo graphs, but then also there was a lot of building involved in it. And I had to hand make um, a Tom Tom that looked right to go with. I wish I had a picture of it, but I, I don't. It was a licensing issue. And the pictures I took were documentation pictures. So I don't have like really pretty like this uh, picture to show you. But, um, you know, I shipped those three pieces off and it was, I want to say $800 to ship it. And it got there. And even with a professional shipper, there was damage. So now you're dealing with, it was shipped to Chicago. Two months later, they ship it to Oklahoma, somewhere in there, it got damaged and they call you back and go, uh, your piece is broken. And I said, well, I asked for, uh, you know, 48 hours that, you know, I would replace it if anything was broken and, and it's two months later and it, you know, everybody's just pointing fingers at each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my shipper takes pictures of everything as it goes out and the whole shipping process, cause she's been there before, but you know what I ended up doing? Replacing that order for free. And should I know? I don't know. Maybe yes. You know, it's hard to say, but you're trying to keep the relationship and you're a person of integrity. So, mm -hmm. you know, that was a lot. And, you know, in that case, you know, I ate my shirt, but you know, it is what it is. Sometimes those things happen. So yeah, it, It's amazing. I, I remember, you know, when I first started the yeah, like, social media stuff and a couple of people were like, oh, your pictures are great. And do you sell prints? And I'm like, sure, I, I'll sell you a print. And and uh, somebody wanted to print and I forget what I charge. It, it not not a whole ton of money. And, the, and I said, what's your address? And I'm writing it out. And they said, it's Nova Scotia. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I went to ship. It was like one, it might have been like an 11 by 14 size. It was like $40, $50 to ship up there. Yeah. The slow, I'm like, oh my God. I just, like, I literally think I, I might have broke even. If not, I lost money because I never factored in something. And again, when you're doing it as a hobby, it's not the end of the world, but those are probably some of the type of, of growing pains that you have when you're like, oh my God, shipping or, oh my God, insurance, or I, you know, all of those things. Yes. And that's what it takes to run a business. And that's why, you know, when you're doing it as a hobby, it's one thing when you have a main job, it, it takes a lot of that pressure off. But uh, I, I do know a lot of people that do professional wildlife photography, and I do hear those, those struggles and those learning curve, those learning pains yeah. um, quite a bit. Yeah. Have you yeah, seen they're go ahead. just part of doing business? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Have you seen changes? So you've been doing this for 10 years. Um, I, I want to shift a little bit from the gallery type thing to the home because you also do yeah. work with interior decorators yeah. or or you may have a client that says, I want a piece for this wall. And now you're kind of working a little bit differently because sometimes do you have to work backwards where you're saying, okay show me what the environment is, I'll cater something, maybe something that you have stock already there, but you're not going to go out maybe and shoot that thing, but you're going to say, okay, I, I see the environment, I see the color palette, I, here's what I can maybe propose. And then do you kind of show them like some ideas? Is that the way it would work with yeah. you're working with an interior decorator? Yeah, I do. And, and give them ideas. Like I'll pull um, this up for a minute here. This is kind of the evolution of my Treatum series, which uh, started out with just so you have an idea as I'm talking about it, it started out with um, this image, which is a, you know, a silhouette shot in Civil Twilight, which is not at all interesting, but I love the patterns on the trees. And so, you know, I'll start with people if they want trees, for example. Um, you know, okay, well, I've got lots of those. What, you know, what are you kind of looking at? Show me the space. Most of the time I will ask people 
to send me a picture of their living room or you know wherever it's going. And then um, I will try to get an idea of that space, listen to them, what do they want to do, and try to design things that would go well. So if they have um, a uh, buffet or, you know, a dining area of some kind, you know, you want something in there that's going to work well with the long dining room table and not feel, you know, you don't want a tall vertical when you're dealing with, you know, a long wide thing. So, okay, let's think about, do we want a triptych up there, meaning three images that kind of either go together or are chopped up of the same image? You know, do you want what kind of color, what kind of feel? Um, I was working with um, one person and I was having them send me pictures of their carpet, send me pictures of their house, like send me pictures of the other parts of the room so that I can get a sense for their style and then also listening to them, uh, you know, to get it right. And, and it's a fun process. And it's, I really like that custom consultation thing because you really end up, uh, when you're done, you know your client's going to like it because they essentially built it with you and you send them mock-ups and you know short of a disaster you know you're you're in pretty good shape it does take longer um you got to factor that into the time and the cost but uh but that's a really fun process but yeah you can start like i'll pull this one up here and really got to think about now I'll, I'll explain this image in a minute here but you really have to think about the environment in which it's going. So a lot of times what I do, and you'll see more of this on my new website, um, but what I do for clients now is I'll pick pieces and I'll put them in, you know, different types of rooms. And just like this, this is my image, but I've put it into a room that it would work. By the way, Pantone color of the year for this year for the first time ever is two colors and it's this specific yellow and this specific gray. So, you know, I wanted to tie that in, but you know, people need to kind of see where it's going to be. They can send me a picture of their living room and I will you know, kind of Photoshop a version of it onto their wall so they can um, just decide if it works. And it also helps me get an idea of scale. So, you know, if I know their sofa is 80 inches long, let's say, um, then I have to think about, okay, well, do we want it to go to the edge or is there something over here? that's you know a sconce or something that's going to get in the way like people just have no clue about sizing and they might say well I need a you know 20 by 30 and I'm like okay well do you really because if we put it in here 20 by 30 is going to end up looking wrong you know it's either mm -hmm. too short too long too tall too something so um in his background of that I used to work um at a florist shop I was a floral designer for 15 years I put myself through college and grad school doing that. And I worked with interior designers. And so like they would come to me and say, hey, I need this big wall piece. It needs to be these colors, these textures. You know, I'd get to see the wall. Sometimes I would go to the home and also be part of that consultation process. And so that kind of stuff comes naturally to me because I had a lot of experience in that. And so I kind of borrow from that industry as well and try to get people what they're looking for. And what I love about this stuff is these are pictures that I call, you know, they have good bones, you know, so that original tree picture was this, plus I photographed another one right next to that tree. And then I played with the colors and inverted it and, you know, created a Photoshopped version of this. But what's, um, what I love about it is you can utilize a lot of pictures that still have good bones and aren't necessarily going to make it into, you know, Nat Geo or, you know, the mm -hmm. cover of whatever magazine it, it is. Um, it's art inspired by nature. And I love that I can use my camera and then translate it. And there are so many more opportunities out there when you think about it that way in the different buckets that you can shoot for. This mm -hmm. becomes one of my buckets now. So, yeah. And it's yeah. interesting because we, you know, we talked about the, those different buckets and, and you take full artistic license to edit a photo while there are some people that are real purists and I'll talk to people and they're like, no, I don't, yep. I don't do anything. You know, it's exposure yeah. and a little, you know, saturation or contrast and color correction. And that's it. And that's what I post. And I don't believe that you should have touched a picture. Um, I, I don't believe that, but you know, I edit pretty, pretty liberally. Uh, I have a theory that for me, I want to um, keep the integrity of the scene. So, you know, if there's a branch in the yeah. way and I take it out, it's still the integrity of the scene is kind of what it is, what it is. Um, I, yeah. I don't believe in adding in. Now, if somebody said, Scott, I'll write you a check for uh, $2,000. If you want to put something on your wall, I'll do whatever he wants. 
I'll put butterflies right. and I'll change the colors <laughs> all around or do whatever you want. So um, yeah, I, I know that exactly. you showed in, and I don't know if you have it available, but I remember you showing an image and it might've been a great egret. It was kind of a, uh, it went to a very high key off centered yes. composition, but it's not at all where it started. And you, I think you even said you kind of worked through this trying to figure out like it didn't look amazing out of camera. So I don't know if you have the before of that image, but I, I thought it was really interesting because, you know, you talked about sometimes you just see potential in an image and it's one of those images out of camera right. that a lot of people would have said, no, nah, this, uh, this is nothing. I got to, you know, I'm not going to work with this. And then it turns into like, whoa, like that'll work. Yeah. Was it this one, Scott? And it might not I, have been. I have another one in mind if I, this wasn't it. I think it was, but it didn't start off like that. No, it was, it was, this image is, um, I don't know if I can pull it up really quickly because I'm not on the same computer, but this original image, it was shot in high key. Um, and so this, this uh, egret was darker, right? It was, it was, yes. if you looked at the scene, it was a, you know, underlit egret because it was in shadow and then the sky behind it was gray so I could overexpose blow out that egret to white and preserve the detail and then I did some hand painting with this and kind of played around with it but it, it, that is like that is something that I really I have I, I want to say that I I am bilingual and and I know that there are purists out there that say oh it needs to be exactly so or it's not photography all right I can shoot that way talk about the different buckets I can shoot that way and I'm sorry I don't have that raw image here at the moment but then I can go here's another um, egret too but then I can go and shoot in a different way so this particular image in the raw format um, was not on, you know, terribly different from this other than I started doing some brushwork on here and really playing with the colors and just softening it up a bit because, you know, the, the previous picture is great for magazines and this one is better for your wall, you yeah. know, and, and that's what I'm finding is people people don't like you know i have a hard time selling nature images authentically because many people not all but when you get into people who care about decor a lot they tend to not pick the full color nature images they might pick a black and white mm -hmm. but when you're talking about color harmony and things like that in a room and going into the day decor it, usually our nature images are way too colorful they're they're meant we've all been trained up to teach uh, excuse me to shoot magazine and calendar style. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what every workshop's about. Yep. Every, you know, YouTube video, you know, every class you take is all about, I mean, granted, some of that's changing, but it's all about getting that format right, getting everything technically right for that magazine or calendar. And very little talks about, well, gee, you know, there's also a high need for shots for banners for you know the the website banners and that's a completely different aspect ratio and you know the the genre to get things onto a wall in someone's home requires different rules and I talk a lot about the different rules but we've always been just kind of playing by these one set of rules for so long and it's it's time to think in a multilingual way you know those rules play it that way for that genre then you know these other sets of rules and play it that way for this genre and next time you go out in the field you have double the amount of opportunity to shoot things because you can be bilingual in how you execute your shot. Yeah. And I think, and you can, you can correct me or, or, you know, if you have a different opinion on this, but I think you know, somebody asked, uh, is this like a painterly effect? And it, I clearly, I mean, I, I can see it very small on my little screen because I have like a hundred screens open, but it, I remember this yeah. image and it does have kind of this painterly effect. And mm -hmm. while, while some, some people will look at that in an, in like a, an Instagram feed. And again, when they're comparing it to technical perfection and documentation, they would say, oh, you know, she, she if Lisa photoshops that stuff and it, that, yeah. that's not what, that's not what bird photography is supposed to be about. However, right. the, the only real right image when you're doing this professionally for art is what that client is willing to buy or what they want. And if this is right. what a client, if this is the look they're trying to get in their decor, then right. the technically perfect egret probably doesn't even work in that house and nobody's buying it. Right. Right. That, that's exactly it. I find many times 
that people don't want the ultra realism that we get with the magazines. I mean, you pick up a magazine, you expect, I always say, you know, the water droplets on the eyelashes and the water splashing, you know, if a bear is catching a salmon or whatever it's doing, like you expect all that drama, that high, high sharpness, you expect all that. But in a house, in a living room, you got to think about what's the ambiance that they want? What's the color palette? Most people want their living room to be a source of serenity, a sanctuary. And having all that drama and all that ultra sharp and all that color is just completely wrong for that environment. They wouldn't pick it out. It's why you don't typically see full color sharp images, you know, of you know, landscapes or the bears or birds or whatever, when you go to the big box stores to buy, you know, just what I call like commonplace decor, nobody's doing that. Why? Well, you got to be thinking about the color palettes and things. So, you know, and this, none of this occurred to me right away. I just, your camera is a tool. And if your goal is to go and get things published in magazines and calendars and, you know, stock photography for that, then please do it. And I mean, I'm all about that too. I'm not changing my genre. I am adding to it, but you got to understand that we can't take these things and expect them to work in another environment all the time. There'll always be some Venn diagram. There'll always be someone that wants that bear, you know, water splashing, salmon bleeding, whatever, you know, they're going to put it in their living room, but most people won't. And that's what I'm trying to say is we're, we keep taking, uh, I don't know which term to say, you know, a round thing and putting it into a square hole or a square thing and trying to put it in a round hole. And they're different markets. And I'm just, I love, I mean, I've been artistic since I was a kid. I, floral design, I'm always loving the ethereal, you know, beautiful, wispy, gauzy kinds of things. And that's what I love to do in my photography as well. And, and then translate, I mean, Photoshop's a tool. It's, it, it, to me, it isn't an argument of are you a purist or not. To me, it's more of an argument about what market are you going for. Mm -hmm. If a j journal, magazine, documentary style where you better not dare move a rock in that picture or change anything but maybe contrast and saturation, then shoot for that. If you're shooting for a magazine, they typically tolerate very little of those kinds of things, but it depends on the magazine. If you're doing home design, that's a different set of rules. And and I think it's more about you're not wrong and I'm right or I'm wrong and you're right. And it's more about which genre are we talking about and what's the purpose of the image. And yeah. I will go out in the field now. And that's my question is where is this going to live? Yeah. Is this I going to live in a magazine or a house? Yeah, and I think the one thing we would both agree on is there is never – like this is never right or wrong. This this one hour, hour and 15 minute show is not to try to convince people to do this, by the way. Yeah. This is yeah. simply an experience that that has worked really well for you. And a lot of people, do, because of that kind of purist mentality around photography that some people have, especially with wildlife, for many people, the belief is that I am documenting wildlife as a documentation of what I see. Yeah, but, but that and that works if that's what you want to do. That's like there's no judgment against it. I actually yeah. kind of like that stuff. So yeah, that's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. But but if you're trying to, or if you wonder why nobody, why I'm not successful getting stuff on walls, it it might be because of that style. And maybe you're just not. Maybe the expectation is I shouldn't be trying to think of my stuff as wall art or home decor or you know trend or yeah. fashion. Now you mentioned a couple terms. Real quickly, I just want to get back to I, I actually pulled up a picture um, of, of of a triptych that you had taken, and there's several on yes. your website in the wall art section. So I kind of scrolled through there real quick. Um, this one, I don't know if you could see it, but it's it's got a little piece of wood, and it's a little abstract. It's very earth toned. It's really, really, really beautiful. But you're seeing a trend probably Aww. more towards this stuff. Right. Like even more recently, do you see yeah. it? So diptych meaning two, triptych meaning three. But I mean, you, you see more of this now than maybe 10, 15 years ago. Absolutely. I do. And I did an experiment um, three years ago and then I did it again uh, this year where I just went to Pinterest. You guys can do this, too. Um, I went to Pinterest because that's where you see a lot of trends. I was just kind of curious what I'd find. And I typed in keywords like wildlife, photography, art. Um, you know, stuff like that. You play with those keywords, wildlife photography, decor. And what came up three years ago, and I, I don't have that showing at the moment, but there was nothing. There was absolutely nothing that came up on the first page of Pinterest search results. And it was all galleries of people and families and um, galleries of things. So multi, you know, collages on the wall of things. And um, there were 
were two things that sort of related to nature. One was a painting of flowers and the other one was a agate slice. And that was it. <laughs> and so um, I did this three years later. I did this back in January again, and I came up with so much more. But it was all things that I've been doing. And it's, I'm not saying I set the trend. I'm just saying this is what I'm seeing. But high key stuff, desaturated, a little bit more artistic, soft, painterly kinds of things things. I mean, that's, I'm glad to see. And that's one of my goals is I love nature. I want people to love it too. I want it in people's homes. Let's do it in a way where they're receptive to it. And so I'm starting to see more and more of that, which is good. I mean, earthy organic is, is in, um, but there's certain things that just work well. And you've got to be thinking like an interior decorator, plus a photographer, plus an artist, as opposed to just what magazines expect, which is show me what this animal does in its habitat, you know, and that's why you're getting all these wonderful pictures. And that's not wrong. I've done that for my whole life. Um, and I still do that. But now I can think more flexibly. A couple questions. So one is, uh, somebody actually asked, what do you process in? So just I, I assume they mean like, software? Is it Photoshop, Lightroom? Do you use other processing techniques or yeah. do you and do you use like plugins and filters and stuff like that in your workflow um yeah i use uh, let me see if i can pull my screen back up um let's see here so i'll go back to um find my folder here I, I use a variety of things i use photoshop primarily i do some digital painting uh, in photoshop sometimes i will use uh textures sometimes i will use um, my two favorite tools are uh, nick by dxo topaz um, those i'll use on occasion it just depends on what look i'm going for and what tools I need to get that look. But uh, Photoshop is my go-to. Uh, of course, you know, Lightroom or Camera Raw or any of those kinds of things for the basics, but Photoshop is my go-to. And then I like to just play and see what I can come up with. And the most important question of all was just asking. and I completely forgot about this. So Edgar, thank you for reminding me. When you're in the field, uh, first of all, do you shoot with Nikon or Canon? I shoot with a cannon. Okay, that's not the yeah. most important question. That's step one. Step two, <laughs> I'm going to have to pull it up here. Uh, are you a back button focus shooter? <laughs> I am. Uh, I am a back button <sighs> focus shooter. And um, I, well, it, it, for me, what I like about it, and I, I take it, Scott, that you're not, but for me, what I like about it is the fact that I can um, track a bird through the air and I only have to push that shutter when I'm actually deciding that decisive moment. And if I let go, it doesn't necessarily lose focus. Now, the game may be changed. Um, and I'm so used to back button focusing. I've been doing it for 10 years. I don't know if I could get out of the habit, but um, the game may be changed. I just bought, it isn't even here yet, the new Canon R5 mirrorless. And that has that eye tracking software. So we shall see whether or not that's still a thing, but apparently you can do back button with two back buttons now. So um, that's going to be an interesting thing, a, a little bit of a, you know, a learning curve to get my muscle memory to be doing that instead. So, uh, but yes, I am a back button focuser. So it's, it's an ongoing kind of, it's a running like joke. And I'm on sorry the show. that I can't see the, the chat window at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> so we, I have, a, I have a thing about, I act, cool? yeah, I actually made a video about back button focus. And it's, it's a long story for me, like why this is a, a thing for me. And it really just got back to, it doesn't really matter. Like whatever you do is fine. But then I just kind of made this big joke about it. Like, so I resent back button shooters by nature. Um, <laughs> but you're kicking my ass because now out of the last 15 guests that I've had, 10 are back button focus shooters and only five, including myself, shoot with shutter release. So anyway, I'm getting my tail kicked on back button focus. And I swore Tobias Yoder <laughs> It, uh, I had him on the last show. I swore that I would not invite any more back button focus shooters. So I'm going to have to, I'm just, I, I keep forgetting to ask before I book people if they're back button focus shooters. So anyway, the, uh, thank you for, well, thank you for answering that. Yeah. But you know, two of my dearest friends are not back button focusers. One, the, the ergonomics don't work for her hands. She's got small hands and it's too uncomfortable. And the other one just doesn't. So, you know, I could give you two names. I was going to say, if they're, if they're really good <laughs> photographers, I'm going to book them on the show because I am, I am determined to catch up soon. All right. And if you look <laughs> in the comments, it's funny. Yeah. I'm, I'm scrolling through. I would guess Gosh, every single person that answered is back button focus shooter. So anyway. I love it. All I right. Love it. I'm, I love I'm, it. I am determined. I will never give in. 
I am never giving into back button focus. All right, let me see if there's any questions that come up. I do try to keep the show around an hour. We could, I, I know the problem is you and I could probably talk for like two or three hours. Um, yeah. I'm not on a time limit, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to end the show now because I think there's still questions out there. I would like to know um, if you have a question specific for Lisa. I have a couple more questions that I did want to ask. Um, but if you have a question for her, go ahead and, and put that in the chat box. I am going to play a quick game with Lisa um, while the questions are coming in. So I, right. I told Lisa I had a game for her. I wasn't going to tell her what it was. And I, I, I only asked that she be brutally honest and that she um, not be afraid of hurting my feelings. So the game is called, and I'm going to pull this up. The game is called Art or Crap. <laughs> and you can only pick one or the other. You, you cannot say, well, maybe, no. It is either art or crap. And here's, the, here's how I need you to approach it. You are an interior decorator who has a client. And the client likes birds. And they want a bird and, and we're going to go through categories. So first it's going to be a songbird. And you have to tell me of these four images that I'm going to show you of songbirds, which ones are art and which ones are crap in your opinion. Okay. All right. All right. And Scott, I need to figure out how I see your screen. Okay. So, You're, um, oh, you've got to stop sharing your screen. Okay. So let me, yep. uh, I thought I did, but let me see here. Um, hold on. Bear with me. Oh, we'll figure it out. There's some questions coming in. I'm okay. Sure. So there's, stop sharing all right so now what my and, friend <laughs> yep and now i'm going to go and i am going to share my screen let's see okay, if i can i'll let you know this all is right good. there nope. we go that, oh. i don't know if that's the right one hold on let me share another screen i let me see if i can figure this okay. out this is kind of fun figuring out how to do this all real time <laughs> i told them it's a live show you gotta you gotta deal with this stuff all right this that's right. one that's right let me see. I don't think there's a person in the world now who hasn't had this experience. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I've got a, I just, I, I randomly threw a Flickr album. Now I, I need people to understand. I did not pick images that I thought were art. So these are not for your followers, <laughs> for people who came here. I don't want them looking at this stuff like, oh my God, this guy thinks this is going to go on somebody's wall. I mix this up on purpose. There are definitely images in here that I do not think would work as art. And for those that don't know me, who, who have never watched the show, I am a, an avian photographer. I shoot a lot of birds and I do not consider all of my work fine art. I have a separate gallery of things that I think actually do work as art. And in all of that, I do try to keep uh, integrity of the scene. So even in my, my what I would consider wall art, um, I, I don't take a, a lot of liberal uh, artistic license. I do modify and edit 100% almost every image I touch. I do think that's actually a big part of making images yeah. look good is some talent around the editing. But I'm going to show you four songbirds. And if they all stink, that's fine. But you do have to pick one for your client <laughs> at the end. All right, here we go. First one. Okay. This is a... And Scott, I got a question. For, I got a question for you too. Yeah. As is or with some side of editing? As is. As is. As is. All right. And it's only one or no, the other. I it's love... either art or crap. Oh, it's not crap. <laughs> if you got, I'm going to make you say uh, it, Lisa, because you're such a nice person. I know it's going to uh, it's going to pain you to call my stuff crap, but I know, I, this is I can I can is, handle it. Is, uh, so I would say this would be more for magazines. I, I can't say crap. This would <laughs> you be literally more for can't say it. However, Scott, I seriously, there's Lisa. It's crap. You know it's crap. And this could easily work. It's not crap. It's not crap. I would love to have that warbler. It's that's but, the game. The game is making you say that my stuff is awful. That's the whole point of this. All right. I can't. All right, we got it. The okay, audience got it. This going. is crap. We get it. All right. So prairie warbler. Okay. Prob but again, yes. nice picture might look good somewhere, but yes. probably not hanging twenty by thirty yes. in somebody's living yes. room. All right. No. Let's go to nope. the next one and see what this one's. I like that one. I, a beautiful warbler, beautiful picture. Um, I think this could work. You've got simple color palette. This might work. I would say maybe soften the treatment a little bit and make it a little more painterly, but beautiful image, not crap. Okay. All right. This one I just read. By the way, most of these I posted in the last like two months. I just kind of grabbed random okay. images. So these aren't like, I didn't have an agenda. I did try to get a couple like small in frame and tight shots. I did try to pick a few out in each. And I, some vertical and some horizontal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I love this shot. And I think 
it has potential. I'd like to soften it up a little bit, but I think it has definite potential for a home because it's got a lot more negative space than we're used to. And I'm a big fan of that. Okay. So, so uh, I can't um, say crap or not crap, but okay. this I love. I adore this. Okay. Adore this. Yeah, this is this is the opposite of crap. This is gorgeous. Well so done. Of the four, if you if yeah. a if a person just said, "Hey, I want a soft image of a pretty bird," and, and yeah. it, this you would go with this of the other I four. I would definitely. Is go there with something this one, about yeah. this one that stood out compared to the other four? Um, you know, it's, it's feminine, it's soft and not that an image has to be feminine. I'm just saying if it's going in someone's bedroom, let's say, or bathroom or, you know, maybe living room too, the color palette is simple. You've got some really pretty, um, kind of plays on, on color harmony here. Um, that color also is very popular in homes, that kind of sagey yellow, limey green color. I think that would work really well in a home. I love that image. I think it's beautiful. You use the yeah, term soften it up a couple times and you use the word feminine yeah. a couple times. And I think it's interesting. So when you are thinking about the home, do you find, is it your experience that those are the images that typically want, as opposed to, let me show you this, uh, this image, you said you would yeah. soften this up. Now, to me, this is yeah. a very contrasty, moody, yeah. and I don't want to use masculine feminine, but if it, it feels like, you know, stronger, I guess, is, is yeah. in terms of that presence. Um, and I yep. think you're right. You use the, the word, this one felt, I think you said this one felt feminine and it's, it's that soft color palette. Yeah. And those are and probably part of things... that is my, yeah, okay. go ahead. Sorry, Scott. I was just going to say, uh, uh, that is what I'm hearing is that those are the kind of, uh, moods that tend to work better. People may not want to bring those dark contrasty elements. Now they may have rooms in the house where that, where this wouldn't work. Right. There may be a space where they want a very aggressive tone and you put a soft right. kind of palette in there and it, it's like, well, what is this? But you you would say more often than not, if you had to just guess, you would go more soft palettes. Yeah, it, it tends to be. Yes. And even that previous image of your warbler on the pine. If you added a texture or something to that, I think that could help. And even that one, you know, some texture, a little bit of a, a painterly effect. Um, people tend to not like the super crisp, sharp, real stuff. And, and you know, maybe it's just the people that I'm running into. But again, I'll go back to look at your big box stores and just look at the commodity art. Not saying that that's what we're creating, but look at what a lot of people are buying. And it tends not to be this ultra sharp stuff for homes. It's amazing for magazines, for advertising, for a lot of things. It's just not tending to be what people will put in their homes. There are exceptions, though. I love that because of the negative space, but that 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 purple and green one that you have is just beautiful. Yeah, I love that. And this is very beautiful, too. I okay. could see this as a black and white, and I could see that as art in the home. I mean, as a black and white, I think it would be ridiculously beautiful. So I, I have probably... I, I think I have four or five raptors, so I'm going to scroll through okay. them. So that one's okay. a maybe. I'm going to make you say it. Say it. Um, I would not put that in the home. I say would it. put that in a magazine. Say it. I, it's not crap, but for the home <laughs> crap, how's that? I can't do that to you. <laughs> this is a, so this is a, I'm a, I love hawks. I love hawks. Uh, this yeah. is one of the closest looks I ever got at a Broadwing hawk. And uh, the reason I put this in intentionally, because I expected you to say this is not something I would put in the home as a I can show this to a raptor person and they'd be like, oh, my God, that's an amazing photo. And again, yeah. two different audiences, two different genres, two different purposes. Um, I would agree this is probably not something I would put on my wall, but it's a really close look at a bird that around here we do not see very close often. We don't see yeah. this this species at this range very often. Um, this no. is a different species. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Is it that art? Is awesome. Like, what do you think? I see this as a cover shot. Um, I don't necessarily see it as something going, it's pretty aggressive for something going into someone's home, but that's, you know, my personal interpretation. I don't know the home yet. Um, but I would say possibly in a commercial space done in black and white, it could be really cool. And think commercial space, it's usually you want more energy, you need a little bit more dynamicness, and commercial spaces are typically pretty sterile. There's not a lot of other decor. You go into a home and you got pillows and furniture and plants and, you know, kind of like lots of extra clutter. Clean and simple and soothing is 
tends to be better, but I could see that as a black and white in a commercial space, you know, in, a, in an entryway or something like yeah. that. Very, yeah. very interesting. And, and, you know, you, you say that now I'm thinking that that makes sense. Like this, this isn't something I would put now, by the way, you said a cover shot. This is actually going to be a cover shot. <laughs> so there's a, there's a Hulk watching magazine awesome. that I actually donate to because it's a nonprofit and I, they generally once a year put out a publication and, and they said, do you have something for this year? And I said, what do you think of this? And they said, that's a cover shot. That's it. <laughs> I didn't even have to send them it another is. one. They said, that's it. it it's a perfect cover shot. You've got room for them to put space in, in text. It's a vertical, which people don't usually think of shooting vertical. And it's a killer shot. So way, way to go, Scott. I love this. This is amazing. Okay. I already know the Aww. answer. <laughs> yeah, this would, this would be probably no in a home. I'm going to say this, though. This is an awesome shot. But I see it as having potential if we were to do some kind of artistic um, composite where you maybe had a field and you had different hawks. Like I, I'm thinking something very surreal, maybe black and white or sepia, and that bird could be a part of a composite that would be something for the wall. So I don't necessarily say like I it has no use. It just hasn't been put into its proper position for something in the home yet. But that's a killer shot. But as, yeah. to be proud and, of and as again, as is it's I'm a hawk guy. This is this was a, a, a sharp shinned hawk that flew yeah. extremely close. So again, getting these real close looks for a, a hawk enthusiast or a raptor enthusiast who photographs is like, oh, wow, that's great. You got the wingtips and he's spread out. And I don't normally see that pose. And it's a really I guess it's the difference between some shots that are cool. And even on Instagram, I could post this and people would be like, oh, that's really great shot, you know, blah, blah, blah nobody in a million years is going to contact me and say, Hey, could you send me that and frame it? It's just not, it's just mm -hmm. not that image. So yeah, really yeah. interesting. And, and that really very well illustrates the different, I love this, the different purposes of images. And one is great for one purpose and not at all for another. You know, I liken it to, um, you know, getting a steakhouse steak and going to McDonald's or whatever your favorite fast food is. You love, that food when it's the right time for a fast food burger and you love a really good steak or whatever it might be that you really enjoy at the steakhouse but a filet mignon will never sell at mcdonald's and mcdonald's will never sell at a five-star steakhouse it's two different things yeah. both of them are right but they're not both right for the same thing and that's how i see it but i see this as uh being beautiful art i really love this and i what i would do i already is know i would <laughs> I, I well, want to say know. it, but I'm going to let you say it first. Say? I don't want to taint you. I think I know what you're going to say. Go ahead. Okay. I would, I would crop this down into a wide aspect panel and that could look beautiful over a sofa or over a, like a, a banquette or dining room area. I think that's beautiful. I think that also has potential as black and white or a sepia if you want to desaturate it, but those desaturated colors are lovely. I love this image. Yeah. Beautiful. I thought you would say you would make this into a triptych. I would. You could easily see. I make it a little wider. There, but... Yeah, if it was yeah, a little wider. Yeah. yeah. Content you know aware fill. That's all. What's interesting? This was taken at, at one of the most popular places on the East Coast for eagles, and uh -huh. people go there to shoot that. What you're talking about—the fish in the talons dripping with blood—and um, yes, you know, I didn't get. I, you know, I have no problem with that shot. I, I, I take that shot, but there wasn't a lot of action. We were down there and I actually go down there when there's not a lot of action because I like the colors this time of year. And if I get yeah. the action, that's great. But normally I can walk away with something. And this is a, 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 a location where literally I bet you 10 to 20,000 photographers go every year. I'll see, I know this perch, so I'll see every now and then I'll see an image from this perch, but I, I, I don't remember seeing a lot that looked like this. And I, again, it was for me, if I was to take a lesson out of this, it was making something out of just looking and observing and challenging. Like, can I get a shot? Like most people do not yeah. go here to shoot a bird that they can barely see with a, yeah. with a 600 yeah. millimeter lens. But that's, that's what was there. And I thought, you know, the fall colors work and the perch is nice and the kind of like yeah. the pose. So yeah, I went with it. And you know what I love, Scott, that you did with this is you used what nature gave you. Like so often we're in situations like this and someone will take that shot and then they'll try to crop the heck out of it and make it into something 
that it's not. It's not a close up tight, you know, water droplets in the eyelashes, eagle feathers, you can see every little rib. It's not that shot. It's meant to be this. And I think people miss these opportunities. Like they're so headstrong in one type of shot. They have one vision in their mind for what it's got to be. And they would throw this, they would walk right by this opportunity. And to me, you've got this wonderful scene of an animal in its environment. And the reason why many people would walk away from this is we're used to having to conform for the rules of a, you know, magazine that let's say this got a two page spread, which by the way, it would be fantastic. They got room for text, room for a title, but in a magazine, you only have so much space to see something. And if it's a little dot of a subject, nobody's going to look at that in a magazine and be like, wow, you know, but you put that as a, you know, like a, I'm going to say a, a 20 by 40 on the wall, it would be ridiculous. Um, but we don't think like that because we're not seeing it like that. We're yeah. not, you know, our magazines aren't 20 feet wide or 20 inches wide um, or 40 inches wide, excuse me. So it's a different, different sets of rules. You yeah. know? And, so, and I have a, a, you know, I like Instagram. I, I, it gives me an opportunity to meet a lot of people and see a lot of images. Um, one of the things, the danger of, of you mentioned fast food, Insta, Instagram is McDonald's. So one of the <laughs> yes. dangers of that is you cater to the audience. So people tend to steer away from wide scenes, small in frame, and they tend to say, well, that's not what Instagram wants or Facebook sometimes even wants because uh, you're viewing these often on mobile devices. And yeah. if it's a challenge to find out what's happening, people are, you know, it's just a scroll and they just scroll past. Yeah. And sometimes those in your face images are the ones that become the most popular. But again, is that what people want to buy? And it, right. it, it depends what you're doing. Like now, I, I use social media. So for me, yeah, I do, you know, tend to mix it up. And I don't mind putting a tight shot in that I know is not wall art. But if I was if yeah. I was selling just wall art, I don't know that I would even post some of the images that I post, because mm -hmm. I would want people to look at that and say, Oh, I don't want that guy's stuff like it. I don't that's not what I want on my walls. So right. for me, I'm kind of I guess I'm all over the place is what I'm trying to say. Let me let me run through but some. Sh oh, go ahead. Sure. No, I was going to say this. Oh, I love this. This that you're describing exactly the situation about the rules, because in Instagram, you know, you've got a square this big. You can't even do, you know, panos and, you know, odd sizes of things because it doesn't work well in there. Um, same with Facebook to some extent. And so we're conforming to these rules. And that's what we've done with magazines and calendars, conform to these rules. There are other rules. We're just not talking about them yet, you know, and, and that's where I think uh, photography has missed the mark sometimes is what about all the other things? But I loved that image um, of the eagle. And I love this one of the sandpiper here that you, I think it was a sandpiper. Yeah. Somebody asked, yeah. by the way, I just, I scrolled back. Somebody asked what the red was. There's some vegetation there. So I just, I, I looked back because I, I don't remember red being in that image. There's some, some red, uh, probably a tree that it was like October. So probably just changing leaves. Uh, this is a yeah. spotted sandpiper. This one yeah. I, I chose because again, it's like small in frame. It's a little moody, yeah. but, but like to me, I do, like, does it work? Does it not work? It works. Totally works. I love that. I love that you have, you know, you're, I'm a big fan of playing with contrast and you've got your contrast in the right spot with the brightness of the bird. And then the background and the foreground are just supplementary. I love that uh, broken off uh, stick in the foreground too. It sort of frames it. And, and I think this is just beautiful. I love it. And I would keep it. I think this could work in yeah. a home. Also yeah, very weird because uh, I liked this because as a I'm I'm a real bird nerd. Um, these birds typically do not perch. This is a, a sandpiper, and they typically yeah. are on the ground. Um, this yeah. was in a rainstorm. There were actually five of these birds perched oh. all over the place on these stumps coming out of the water. I I don't know why. Oh, wow. I don't know what the reason was, but I took advantage of it. I thought it was pretty unique, so I blasted away I a bunch of photos. I love it. Okay. I love it. I love you're consistently getting these down low eye level images. That's not easy physically or otherwise. <laughs> so kudos to you for that. Oh, I love this um, uh, little uh, larkspur. It's a uh, snow bunting. Or snow bunting. You probably yes. don't no, no. see those down in Arizona. No, we don't. Occasionally <laughs> I used to in Michigan and I don't know why I came up with larkspur. That's not what I was thinking. But yeah, snow bunting. Uh, larkspur is a flower. Don't ask me. But um that's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I don't see it as a home picture, although I will say this, the background is a really pretty color, beautiful for that. I think maybe if this were arted up a little bit, you know, soften it up, add a little hand painting to it, I think it could possibly work. But um, I see this 
as either a vertical as in a magazine or um, I could see this as a two page spread possibly, especially if you cropped over on the right and left a little more room. I don't know what the original looks like, but you put that bird on the right page and they got plenty of text for the left, it would work for a magazine. So I think you have a multi-purpose image here. Oh, oh, hold, on, hold on, hold on, I skipped one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I love that. That is freaking amazing. This How is. Did you get I shot this one like this that? year. So this is um the the bokeh in the background is and actually I I moved. To, you know I'm like inching trying not to scare the birds to get. I'm like I'll just stay there. I can move over a little bit and get them in those lights. Um, it's it's city lights. So this is at dawn and it's the the sun is just breaching the horizon and it's actually hitting glass buildings on the other side of this inlet. Wow. And that's what you're seeing in the background. So it's not, um, sometimes you'll get like lighthouse lights or, you know, actually bright lights. This was the, the ref I'm pretty sure this was a reflection of the sun in windows across the uh, little wow. inlet there. That is magical. I love that. You had to be so excited to get that shot. That is, I like this. That one. is a beautiful shot. Yeah. Yeah. So let, let's just, and I did this kind of on purpose. So I, I, I was hoping you would like that one because <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, I hope I she do. likes this one because I really like it. Um, you you would say this one maybe wall art, but this one probably not. Probably, you know, and again, art is an opinion, right? It is what people like and don't like. For me, I think it might be the bird would be too big in the frame by the time you'd blow it up large enough and it would have like this three foot tall, you know, bird. Um, but I mean, maybe, and again, maybe if we, we just add a little more painterly effect to it. But this I really, really love. I think, again, if you did it, um, you know, crop some of that blue sky out for the purposes of putting over a, a you know, a, a, you know, a wide, anywhere wide, right? Like a, you know, a banquette, a dining room table, a sofa, anything like that, I think it could really, really work. Um, and I love it. It's it's soft and you have some simple, simple color palettes. You do in the other one too, though. I don't think that's the issue with either one, but I love that. I mean, if somebody had a beach home, I could see that going there. And you've mentioned a couple of times cropping it wider. So is that just something you, because I think you're envisioning this as something over probably a sofa, which is probably the most mm -hmm. common. So that typically is a wider piece or maybe a collection of two images or three images that might not be wide, yeah. but the whole piece ends up being very wide aspect. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You got to think about the perspective. And if we were to blow this up, like a typical sofa somewhere between around 75 to 90 inches, you know, ballpark. And if you were to blow that up large enough to fit and make a stately piece over that sofa, it's going to be so tall that it overwhelms the space. So you'll have an image that's as tall as your sofa vertically. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you take some of that out and, you know, crop it in, um, you know, just so it takes some of the top off, maybe even a little of the bottom so it's wider, you can fill that space and not have it feel like you've got this massive print over the sofa. Now, maybe there's a room with really tall vertical, uh, you know, ceilings with, you know, 12, 15 foot ceilings. Maybe it can handle that. But typically when it's as large as the sofa, it tends to be an issue. So Good. I would All say right. crop it a little bit. Now I'm, I'm going to, I think I have three or four ducks here. So uh, again, these, I had a really good, I think most of these I shot in the last like two weeks, but uh, I did throw one in from Alaska um, because I, it, and it was a little bit of a compare and contrast. You'll see it in a second. So okay. this is an image that I think is, is really cool. It is. Would it go on a wall? As is, you don't get to change this as, I, is. as is you are the bro. You are the broker oh. for a client. She says, I love ducks. <laughs> I, I trust your judgment. Yeah. Go find me I a duck. Is this one if, on the wall? If she's a duck lover, I think it could work. Here's why. You don't have a lot of those colors that we see in a lot of the images. I adore that taupey background. And the water is taupe colored. Those eyes just stand out. The black works. The cream works. I mean, those are colors that you see in homes. The taupe, black, cream, gray, those kinds of things, it's in. And I think that's why this might work. And, um, you know, especially if she's a duck lover, but it's beautiful. I mean, it's a stunning image anyway. Your work is gorgeous, Scott. But I'm thinking that has dual merit because of the color palette. You know, a lot of times we get these gorgeous water with the fall colors or the, you know, green backgrounds and this and that. And it just doesn't work for house, but that would. Interesting. Okay, good. And then let's compare these because these are both close waterfowl. Yeah. This one's a, a kind of a frame filler. This one's a frame yeah. filler. If you had to pick yeah. between the two, which one would you go with? 
I would pick the duck. Okay. But um, that said, <laughs> not if my client loved loons or not if it was a house in Minnesota or something like right. that, then I might think of think of this as a possibility. I might also think of desaturating it and doing it in sepia as well. Um, this doesn't have a lot of color it. The eyes are, of course, that's what loons eyes do. Um, but the blue in there, um, I would like to see it as a, as a sepia or, you know, just an off black and white as well as a black and white. It'd be interesting to see. And it'd be interesting at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I think, it's what the client thinks. So right. you could show them all three and go, hey, which one would you prefer? And interesting that like, and this is kind of what I, I was hoping that we would get from this interview is, you know, you're seeing this stuff and your reaction is not, I wish it was a little sharper. I wish the eye was more detailed. I would, it's all I wish, or if I had to change it, how would I get mm -hmm. it? How, what would I do to process this to make it more aesthetically appealing in the home? Yeah. And yeah. there's a big and difference. And it's a big mindset change from people <laughs> that are looking for magazine work. Cause you're never going to hear somebody in magazine work probably say like, Oh, I would mute the colors. I would dull it down <laughs> right. a little bit more. You know, I would go sepia <laughs> with the that. treatment. Like you're not probably not going to hear that a lot, but, but from no. your standpoint, that's what you're seeing based off of years of experience of what work. And I will tell people, this is an expert. Uh, I saw some questions in there. Do you do, uh, do you teach? Do you work? Go to the website. Yes, she does it all. She teaches. Yeah. She does online stuff. She does in print stuff. She does workshops. She does it all. This is her living. So I'm not going to take up any more time with it. She, I'm, I'm plugging her pretty hard right now. She's wonderful. <laughs> Go check her out. All right. Yeah. Thank you. This one oh, I took last week beautiful. or two weeks ago. You're killing me with these shots because I haven't been able to get out and shoot, you know, like <laughs> real nature in a while um, between, you know, a, long story short with, you know, the cancer last year and then COVID, you know, rolling right out of that and into COVID. And I just feel like I'm dying to get out there. This is exquisite. It's like somebody put a beam of light on this duck and it is just killer, 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 killer work. I love this. Um, if I were a hunter or which I hate the thought of ducks dying because of that but just thinking of the the buyer mm -hmm. um a hunter a nature lover I mean this has got a lot of color I'll say this with with this image being the way it is I mean it's got gorgeous light think of the magic that the painters of you know years gone by have done you know the the wonderful master painters they're so exquisite in their use of light so I see that in that way and I could possibly see this going in a home that would have maybe some hunter green and taupe and, you know, cream um, where this would stand out. Maybe you don't have a lot of color elsewhere in the room and this would be that little punch of color. Um, that's my thought. And then I would say to you, Scott, while you're there shooting that scene, what else can you shoot that would be the the supporting actor shot. So if this is part of the main, you know, feature image in the living room, let's say, what else are you going to shoot to go with it? If you had this in a, in a collage or a gallery on that wall, and that was one of the main ones, what's the one that's second biggest up to the right? What's the one that's the tiny five by five on the wall or 10 by 10 or whatever? Like think about all of that in addition to this duck. And I like to do that a lot of think about, well, what, what could I make and what else is this scene giving me right now to be those supporting pictures? Because if you look at a lot of decor today, it's not all the, you know, just the, I call it the lead actor or the main actor shots. It's the supporting actors as well. And together it makes a really beautiful scene. So. Good. And, and one of the things about this, and this is um, unaltered. This, this is amazing. Yeah, It's unaltered in many ways, but I do, I do, work a lot with light. So I do try to kind of shape light in the image. So yeah. I certainly did that here. Um, yeah, I, I liked this one. I was kind of curious, you know, when you looked at these three, I liked that one better. And then how does that compare oh. with this, which is really small in frame. And this yeah. seemed to be more in your wheelhouse. So very I muted. Yeah, yeah. Not a lot of contrast. Yes. I adore this. I think this would be beautiful, beautiful on a wall. I absolutely love this. Really, really, I do. It's gorgeous. And what I would say is when you're there, then start taking the, um, you know, that little, the white or the bark on that tree and 
maybe create an abstract and that little leaf in the corner maybe grab that and look at some other things in the area and grab some supplemental shots in addition to this so they can all go together with that same palette that same feel that's in the room and really create you know again a, a gallery of things that go together if you had a collection of images yep. and you called it uh is that a a, a blue wing teal i it's tiny in the frame uh, in my that is a ring neck duck it's a female oh, ring neck duck sorry oh okay sorry 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 it's my hard to listen i couldn't ident- if i was there I, it could be a scalp <laughs> i don't know it could be anything <laughs> um so if i had that as you know ring neck duck collection what would I put with that? What mm-hmm. would you see from that scene that would all go together? And that's what I also try to think about when I'm trying to put together stuff for a client. You don't want to just sell them the hero shot. You want to sell them like, okay, but here's what we would put with it. And you've got a, a chair that needs an image over that, or you've got room to put, you know, a nine by nine, right? You know, take five, you know, or, or I don't know, eight by eight pictures, take nine of them, put them on the wall together. Like, what would that be? What, you know, like I try to just think of what else could I pick up while I'm here that would support some of these main actors and you need the supporting actors too. And this is, this is beautiful. Do you sometimes lay out a, like a vertical with two landscapes next to it and make a, like a trio or a trip? Like, yeah. do you do that? Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. The tree that I showed you was that it was yeah. a, a horizontal and then a vertical. Yep. And absolutely, absolutely do that. It, and yeah. it's interesting because as a as a, a I, I'm going to say like a typical wildlife photographer, but you know, somebody who's who, th- that's not the thought process. The thought process is not okay. Let how how am I going to get three stunning images to go together on a wall? We're yeah. so focused sometimes on that on the subject and the subject and the subject and how can I get closer? How can I get closer? How can I get closer? And often that's not, I actually, this, I, I had these ring necks stuck right in front of me. I took a couple of the Drakes and this was my favorite. I did not think at the time it would be, it was yeah, far away. And I kind of saw it going through these trees and I thought, eh, let me, let me take a, a you know, a, a shot. I'm not going to like it, but I'll, I'll shoot it. And now that I went back yeah. to it, I thought uh, of everything I took, I had these ducks right in front of me, you know, just like yeah. fill in the frame. This was the one I came back to. And I said that of that day, this was by far. And it's interesting that you liked, I mean, look at how different these styles are, right? Yeah. Like very yeah. vibrant and very muted. But you yeah. you thought both were appealing. So again, there can be appeal. There isn't a one size fits all. A lot of it depends yeah, on where it's no. going to go. That's right. In the room that it's in. I mean, I have examples if you, by the way, this uh, coming up this week or so, if you go to my website, I'm doing a session called the New Nature Photography. It's a live webinar. And I talk about a lot of this. And you know, for certain houses, I mean, think of the colors. They have Mediterranean blues and these gorgeous sunflower yellows and things like that. I mean, vibrant is not bad. It's just, I try to think about what what the room, you know, like give go your exercise for anybody listening now is to go online and just Google living rooms or, you know, commercial spaces or office buildings or whatever. And, and look at some of those interiors, go watch you know, all those renovation shows that are on right now, like go binge watch a few of those and watch what they redecorate those homes with at the end, pay attention to what they're putting on the wall and how it works with the room and the color palette. Those are criteria that become important. You know, we have been so well-trained in magazine and calendar photography, and I'm not knocking it. It's just, there is more, (laughs) there are more rules. There are more things that we can do and that requires a different vision. And you know, you've done it perfectly. Uh, Oh gosh, you're killing me with these duck pictures. This is Alaska too. I'm I'm teasing you because I know you're going there soon. Uh, Real quick. uh, I want to stop for a second. I've got, we have an amazing audience. So thank you for recruiting. I may have to have you on every week to drive numbers here. Um, (laughs) Thank you for recruiting. If everybody could just personally do me a favor. We have had over 160 viewers consistently, which means nobody left. I need 160 people to go hit the like button because there's an algorithm with YouTube (laughs) and I'm going to abuse it today. So go hit the like button right now while you're watching, because if you don't like this episode with Lisa, they're like, they're just hang, just stop watching. Like there's something wrong. All right. Now I, I, I juxtaposed a couple of these. So let me show you a juxtaposition here. Okay. Same species. Okay. This one, you can only pick one. Customer says my favorite duck in the world is a long tailed duck. Go find me one. Oh. Pick one. Oh, pick one. that one. Yes. One. That one. Yeah. I, I'm a sucker for high key. And this kind of goes into that realm. Well, it's, it really makes you, uh, the other one is this, 
spectacular magazine shot. I mean, that's gorgeous. And again, magazines are going to love it. They can put titles and text and everything around it. Um, and this one is perfect. I mean, think of the colors. Again, you've got your browns and your gray and your off-white or white. I mean, think of the color palettes when people are decorating. Those are great foundational colors. It's not going to compete with other things. It's going to go well. And it's a stunning image. I really love that. I mean, I am a sucker for the high key stuff um, in this, like I said, kind of goes in that direction. And it's, it's beautiful. And a gorgeous duck as well. Just yeah. beautiful. It's one it. of my favorite ducks. I, I was so fortunate to see them in, in Alaska in their breeding plumage. They are so drastically different and so beautiful. It, it, what's interesting oh. about this is I actually think the dark duck plumage worked better with Golden Hour because it really extended the chocolate. Yeah. And this one worked better in the kind of like high key feel. Um, yeah, I liked that one as well. Uh, I, I, I got a couple more to run through. I did a lot of waterfowl okay. this year. Uh, yeah, you, you did. Just go ahead and tell me no on this one. I would say magazine shot, but not interior. And okay. that's just because it's so close and in your face yep. and kind of extra. Oh, God. You between me between the two, answer. this one, right? Yeah. And I, again, I did it. Scott. I did it on purpose. I mean, I, I, I showed two different. They're actually both yeah. mergansers. They're different species of mergansers. But again, some people might see this and think, oh, my gosh, that's so cool. You got so close. Not really works on a wall. This one lighting's much better. I kind of. I kind of anticipated yeah. you would like this one. Um, what about this one? Hmm, I, um, maybe. I. What I'm thinking with this one is I'm thinking triptych, and we kind of rearrange the composition a little bit um, where you have two ducks in one panel, sky in the next one, and then a third panel. And I don't know if you have another sister shot of a duck putting that one over there. And I think that would be really, really beautiful. Or maybe, you know, a couple ducks in each one, each panel. But I think triptych, vertical, and two ducks in one, a blank one in the middle, and a duck in the other just to follow it through. I think that'd be stunning. I'm going to show you one more now. I will, I'm going to preface this. If you don't like this, you're going to break my heart. I haven't posted this image. I teased it on Instagram. It is um, probably my favorite image. This, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm just, this is simply for um, validation. Okay. Oh, Scott, I tell you what, you are a very skilled photographer, and I just, this is adorable. That's, that, this might this be my favorite image way. I've taken in a year. Yeah, that is stunning. I'm so excited for you because, you know, for all of us who are listening to this and any photographer, when you get these moments, I mean, you know that, you know, that feeling that you get in the camera where you're like, I cannot wait to get this home and get it on the computer. I so can appreciate that feeling with this picture yeah. and it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. And I could see this when you, when I talk about the, the, um, images that are complementary. I could see two images, not a split, but two similar images with this one. And then go back to the other uh, long tailed duck, the white one, and that one flip it. And couldn't you see those being complementary on a wall mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, and on opposing walls or something like that. But those two things, you got this similar color palette, different enough images where uh, those would be wonderful and and i also could see it because i'm going to add another layer of complexity um the printer that i use pro lab express in grand rapids michigan and no i'm not getting paid to say that they're just awesome people awesome lab um they print on wood and i could see that being stunning Interesting. so yeah just uh, i love those pictures Scott. i those are beautiful. i may reach out to you i am i'm going to say there were a couple questions that came in um I, I will, I, I don't want to get into one because um, Lisa, who's one of my, my favorite, and she's a Patreon supporter and she supports me here. She's wonderful. She asked about mediums, canvas, metal, I, and it's too big. Like the topic is, it would take, I think, too long. So I, I don't want to get in there. I will tell you this though. I, I am doing an episode devoted to the right print for the right medium. Um, yeah. I am going to ask you, maybe not back on that show, because I actually think I'm going to do that one as a pre-recorded, not a live show. Okay. But I, I will um, reach out to you because you're so kind. I know you're not going to turn me down. And no. um, I'll credit you in that video. But I'd, I'd like to pick your brain a little bit more on that if I could. Sure. In the future. Okay. I know you're busy with yeah. workshops and stuff. So I'll, I'll wait That's till you right. get back. But uh, we'll yeah, we'll, we'll touch out. base on that. And um, I am going to say we, we went and I, I went 40 minutes. This is the longest episode I've ever done. <laughs> It doesn't feel like it, but I we have a larger audience now than when we started. 
and that is a credit Aww. to you. Um, you did a wonderful job. Uh, the Skype thing cleared up a little. It glitched a couple times, but it wasn't too bad. And I, I know people are going to stick through this one. Um, thank you so much for coming on, Lisa. It was a wonderful show. Yeah, it was wonderful. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to come and, and see your work as well. I mean, you are a killer photographer. Nobody is going to argue that. It's amazing. And I think you've got several images that are definitely in that crossover where they can work in, you know, one genre as well as another. And um, I just encourage anybody out there to, two things, when you go out there and you take your shots, think about where it's going to live. Don't just take the shot and all the rules that you have learned. Think about where you want this to go, even before you walk out the door and always be thinking about that. Well, I could shoot it this way for a magazine, but if I did a few different things, I could use this for an interior and then go and collect some other things that you could use to support that and create a gallery of things around that image that all go together so different people can buy different pieces of it to go in their home and uh, but i always walk out the door now and think where is this going to live where and i may not know the specific place but i have to have some ideas in mind and and that helps inform my photography in completely different ways so this has been fun scott i've enjoyed it, was, it. it i hope wonderful. everyone has enjoyed it too. Yeah, it, it truly it truly was wonderful I, I thank you so much for the people that are uh that jumped on uh, a lot of new uh names today uh, i would appreciate you supporting the channel just subscribe i mean you know i don't expect yeah. you to watch every episode but go ahead and subscribe to the channel i have a personal goal lisa and i, I each year i give myself a challenge this year was actually youtube and the challenge was <laughs> to grow my subscriptions from three thousand to five thousand um i was getting about a thousand a year that means i had to double that i i i'm adding more content so there's a lot more videos coming out um, I'm going to hit 5,000, I think, by summer, which is nice. And it's because awesome. it is because I have terrific guests on the show. And I think you are going to get me about 50 more subscribers just from this. <laughs> so I appreciate that so much. Thank you. You are welcome. And um, if anybody wants to see more too, um, if you go to focusyourart.com, which is the company that I'm putting all of my learning in now, um, you can see a lot of classes and things coming up. And there are webinars on my website. Just go to the tutorials and webinars page. And a bunch of live stuff is always there as well. So thanks, Scott. Thanks, everybody, for being here. This was so much fun. I enjoyed seeing your work as well, Scott. And it was great to do this together. All right. All right, well, and I will put all of Lisa's information will be in the description. It's probably not there today right now, but it will be there like 10 minutes after this show ends. So um, <laughs> it will be there. Lisa, thank you so much. And thanks for everybody for tuning in to another episode of Wildlife Inspired. I really, really do appreciate your support. And thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to another live episode of Wildlife Inspired. If you're not a subscriber, you're going to want to make sure you hit the subscribe button now. And if you like the video, Give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. I love to hear it. Now you can find me on my social media contacts down here at SKeys Images and on my website, skeesimages.com. If you enjoy the content, you're also gonna to wanna to check out patreon.com backslash wildlife inspired. My subscription site where I take you in the field and behind the scenes, and I offer lots of editing advice in both Lightroom and Photoshop. I also have videos there that are archived only for Patreon subscribers. I do want to thank you for your ongoing support, and I hope we can continue to find inspiration in wildlife together.